Hello, I'm going to talk briefly about carbon-13 MMR spectroscopy and the information that you can get from this spectrum. You should have covered this in the laboratory. There's also all of these slides plus several examples in your spectroscopy workbook. So please practice through that. Read the NMR spectroscopy section in the online textbook for lab. And this is just going to be a quick overview of those topics. So this carbon-13 uh, NMR spectroscopy provides information about the number of carbons and the bonding environment. And I think that's all what I've got on the next page. Two types of information. We get number of carbons, and it's really number of unique carbons, because if the molecule is symmetric, and the chemical shift. So let's take a quick look at symmetry. There's pentane here, but this molecule has a line of symmetry through the middle of it. So in reality, there's these two methyls are exactly the same. And these two methylenes, the CH2s, are the same. And then this one is unique because it's between two CH2s. This is between a CH3 and a CH2. So there's a plane of symmetry through the molecule, and I get three peaks in my NMR then. So number of unique carbons, there's a number of practice problems in your spectroscopy workbook, and there's practice problems in the online book on determining or predicting the number of unique carbons that you would see in a compound. So carbon-13 also provides you information about the chemical shift. The location of each peak depends on the environment of the carbon atom. There's an x-axis in the carbon-13 NMR, and the x-axis is the frequency, and it goes from 0 to 220. And the two things impact where a uh, peak will show up. So it's approximately split in half by around 100. The things below 100, peaks that show up below 100, are usually sp3. Things that show up above are sp2, that's your impact on geometry. And then any electron negative groups, electron withdrawing groups, will move your peak up, or downfield, sorry. This is upfield, some weird terms, right? And downfield. So you'll move downfield if the carbon feels positive because there's something pulling electrons away from it. So I'm going to jump ahead. There are a number of practice slides in your workbook that walk you through examples of all of these. But these are the regions that you need to know, and that's Around 200 to 220 are aldehydes and ketones. If the, this line goes down here to about 190, these would be enones. So unsaturated ketones, 190 to 200. So pretty much anything above 190 is going to be a carbonyl. 160 to 185 is acid chlorides, amides, and carboxylic acids and esters, so carbonyls within something that can donate electrons toward it and make it feel a little less ele uh, positive, electropositive. 110, 120 to 160 are alkenes, and um, this shows a vinyl ether, but also aromatic rings. So I would put an aromatic ring in here. This is your typical thing you're looking for, alkenes and benzene rings. This is not common. You'll see it in sugars. A carbon with two electronegative atoms bonded to it will often show up around 80 to 90 uh, acetals. But in general, we're going to see our sp3 carbons being between about 10 to 70. Uh, 10 to 40, 35 is your CHs, CH3s, carbons bonded to other carbons. And if it's got an oxygen, a nitrogen, a chlorine, a bromine, some electronegative atom, 40 to 70. 
And then you always want to look for solvent. Our most common solvent is chloroform, and that's always at 77. Okay, so know those regions. There's a Quizlet in linked into the Canvas page for 201 that will test you on these regions. That's a good way to memorize the regions. So you've got chemical shift and you've got symmetry. And those are the two main pieces, number of unique carbons and the bonding environment that you can find from a carbon 13 NMR. So go practice interpreting some spectra and then we'll move on in the next pro, um, video and try interpreting combined carbon 13 and IR problems.